Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Rachel, I love this series because to think about what it means to live a life worth not just living, but inviting others to uh, the goodness of the story of God. We've captured a few key elements, and the one I've been looking forward to maybe the most uh, is this concept of kindness. (laughs) And we've been interviewing some remarkable people, but I think we've got two of the most remarkable people I know, especially in the realm of kindness. And uh, I I wonder if you want to interview, well, do you want to just introduce one of those persons? (laughs) Sure. Um, So, sitting beside me to join us in this conversation is my incredible husband, Michael S. Chen. I'm sorry, the Reverend Michael S. Chen. And I would say um, he is an incredibly kind man. And I look forward to talking more about kindness. As I mentioned in a previous podcast, like I think kindness is so disruptive for our good. But I think we often think about kindness as niceness or um, hospitality, which I think are a part of kindness. But so when I say he's an incredibly kind man, I mean, that means something. And I'll introduce my beloved, uh, and that would be Becky Allender. And I have said publicly and privately that whatever I have learned about kindness and however I have changed, it has been thoroughly related uh, to the nature of her life and how she has loved me. So, we've got two very kind people. And let's just, let me just state an obvious, and that is, we're not asking either of them to debate this. Uh, It isn't an issue of, they need to let us know that there are times they're not kind. I I live with one of them. I know that's true. Uh, (laughs) I'll let you deal with the other one on the other side. But the bottom line is, to be a kind person doesn't mean you are universally at 100% kind. And there have been failures of love. But I know in both your beloved's life and mine that there is this consistency, uh, a kind of invitation into the kindness of God. So, what we want to do is to ask the two of you, and again, to say, welcome, Michael. Welcome, Becky. Thank Thank you. you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that was a nice duet. (laughs) What we want you to begin at least thinking with us about uh, is— how, how did you become as kind as you are? We don't think it's accidental. Uh, we, obviously, there are factors of each of your lives, but there has to be some sense of intentionality for kindness to grow in the way that it has in both of your lives. So, how, how did you become, both of you, how did you become kind? Michael, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> That's clever. <laughs> Well, I love this question um, because, you know, as you look at social media and a lot of um, conversation and dialogue out there, there's just the admonition to be kind. And I think that comes with the assumption that being kind is not easy. Um, it's not taken for granted. And and why is that exactly? And I think about um, over the last couple of years as I've been um listening to the Allender Center, Allender Center podcast, and um, the talk about trauma. And I, I find um, that my thoughts go uh, toward understanding kindness in relationship to trauma and the need to um, kind of hold on to ourselves in those moments of fight, flight, and freeze, mm. uh, not only to extend kindness, but to receive kindness for ourselves in the sense of if we haven't tended to those traumas, I'm not sure if we can really give it uh, in a true way. And so I've really appreciated, I think the last couple of years and thinking about uh, more deeply about my own personal story uh, and trauma and 
regards to what it means to heal. And I think the language of kindness and the kindness of God that leads to repentance for me has been really learning to tend to trauma, to listen well to others, to be able to see that in others in a reciprocal kind of way. I really like that because I think with my work at the Allender Center, that verse, the kindness of God leads to repentance, was always somewhat of a mystery to me. And then through tending to my story and understanding the trauma within my story, I realized, well, I had to cooperate with God in being kind to myself. I had to realize it's actually okay to buckle my shoes, rather put on a pair of flip-flops. Like, I Hmm. could take 30 seconds and buckle one shoe and 30 seconds for the other. That's how unkind Hmm. um, I would be, you know, with all sorts of details. And now I know that it's okay to take 30 seconds to buckle a nice shoe and look nice, if that makes sense. It's kind of the brass tacks. Again, with the work with trauma in my own story, it was easy for me to recognize that my mother uh, was a difficult and impatient woman. And I always would focus on her reasons why she was that way. Uh, Many people, parents of the Great Depression, know that it was a hard time and they didn't have a lot of attunement. They didn't have tending to. And even the fact that she had, she skipped two grades, I think kept her very anxious, kept her always trying to strive and keep up. And then once marrying my father, like there was so much to try and do in her new standing. And I received a lot of her anxiety, um, her impatience. It was such that my father was really the one who would wash my sisters and my hair, or if one of us were sick, he would get up with us. So he was more of a picture of kindness to me and in the unkindness of my mother. But as a child, you love your mother. So it's really hard to separate the two, but uh, realizing a lot of her trauma and, and difficult ways of being in life was because of not being tended to, but it, it, it gave me great understanding for empathy, not only for the other person, but eventually for myself. And I think for me, um, thinking about um, the trauma that's related to immigration, my parents came over from Taiwan, um, both out of poverty and came over to um, work hard for education and uh, to make a better life. And so when I think about um, the level of fragmentation and cutoff that they experienced in the trauma related to immigration. I just think, you know, they did everything that they could. Um, and yet, um, I, I think I and probably my siblings, um, also felt a a sense of lack and that, uh, emotionally, spiritually, even linguistically, it was very hard to connect, um, as a family. And I think out of that trauma, um, looking for places um, where I could process uh, meaning, uh, what it meant to be Asian, um, who I was as a person, those places weren't found in my family. Um, I started to find them in the in the the body of Christ, in the church, in other places, and so I started to experience a real kindness in it that I think gave me a freedom and safety to connect the dots uh, of who I was, who I am, who I'm called to be. And so I think the contours for me, um, I think we've been thinking a lot about just the the heartache of immigration and um, leaving one's sense of home uh, to try to create another one Um, comes with so many different complications. And, you know, I honor my parents for all of their hard work. And yet um, there was such, um, I would say, uh, so many deficiencies as well. Well, the w- wars that you both suffered. Uh, obviously, I hear both of you say that in many ways, the heartache opened the door to desire and to offer kindness, certainly to others. But uh, a, a lot of us uh, would not 
initially say of ourselves that we were kind, and we also had trauma. Uh, so I, it, I, I would want it to be the case that trauma set up people to be kinder, as it did in both your cases. But that's just not often the case. So what else within both of your lives would have drawn you both to become very kind people? I, I think of, I do think, as I mentioned, um, I think the local church body um, to me was uh, unusually gracious and kind. And I, I was someone who really kept the church at arm's length for as, as long as I could. And I I think back now just to the faces of, uh, of youth pastors and uh, phone calls from uh, you know, vol- youth youth volunteers that pursued and wanted to make space uh, for me to process, and to me that was an incredible kindness. In that I can connect names and faces to the experience of kindness that's connected to the body of Christ, mm-hmm. and um, and so I um, I really hold that um, kindness and the resilience that's that comes from kindness is really a communal endeavor. Yeah. And I would say that I love Jesus from as long as I remember. I was in the church a lot. Um, I, I loved Jesus. However, I felt embarrassed of my parents often in the way they would speak to people. And to me, that was a disconnect with what Jesus would have wanted. Um, but yet, I would say also in my teens and young adult life, there really w- there weren't any people from the church or the body of Christ that were connected to me. So that's a little different. I, I wish there had been. Well, in some sense, defiance, at least I, I see that in your life, Becky, that you saw what the lack of kindness brought into people's lives. And I think there was something in you that just said, you know, hell no, I'm not going to operate in the same kind of um, demeaning uh, manner that often came from your mom. But I I, I think as as you two ponder this, uh, are there times that your own kindness unnerves you? Well, uh, yes. I mean, in good ways and bad ways. I remember one of the very first nights I was volunteering on the streets of Seattle with late night outreach, and we would be on the streets from 9.30 to 2.30 in the morning. And the first or second time I was there, my supervisor said, shield her. And I knew right away which um, prostituted woman, young teen, that I needed to stand in front of. And I remember thinking, well, I felt called to be there that evening. We had all prayed as a team, and I thought this would be an unusual way to die because all I could think of is a bullet's coming. But, you know, you do that in the moment, and so that is one extreme that is, astounds me. I think um, just my experience as a, uh, an Asian American growing up in the Midwest, um, I've known kind of some of the just the heartache and the loneliness of not having um, a lot of people who look like me, who share the same story and have thought very deeply about um, identity and belonging. And and so I'm, I'm very sensitive to, I think, the outsider and kind of people on the margins. And I remember... Um, walking up in Philadelphia, walking uh, kind of late at night, and um, heading toward me was a was a was a man lo- looking for a confrontation. Um, and I tried to step out of the way, but he stepped with me. And I said, "Okay, this is my moment here um, to try to extend some kindness." And um, and so I just said, "Okay, what's your name?" And he had kind of a wild, uh, almost drunken look in his his eye, but he was startled. He was very startled by my question um, when I asked him his name. And he said, my name is Africa King. And then he asked me my name. And before I got a chance to answer, he said, you are China King. And 
he promptly got down and started kissing my feet. And I thought this is the strangest <laughs> moment. I hope someone is uh, videotaping this because <laughs> this is the most uh, ridiculous uh, thing I, I think I've experienced. And so he got up and he offered me a drink of his beer. And I said, no, that is for, that is for Africa King. <laughs> and, um, we, and we laughed and, and we hugged, we embraced. And this moment of, you know, where it started off as just asking his name, I think, um, sort of unnerved me and him, uh, disarmed me and him in, in ways that, um, I, I couldn't really ma- imagine, um, how that would unfold. I'm not sure if it, I wasn't sure if it would go well, but I think just my sensitivity growing up and feeling quite lonely, um, in many parts of my youth, um, sort of sensitized me to wanting to, um, extend kindness and know people, um, who aren't usually known. Well, the obvious sentence of he was wanting a defensive response. Uh, And if you had defended uh, in any form, I don't mean just aggressively defend. I mean, just tightened and push back. Um, It would have been, in many ways, uh, a, a dark confrontation. But the reality is, it, your kindness uh, offered one of the most important gifts that we give to the world, and that is a name. Um, mm. You know, when you look at so many of the protests, uh, there's been this call: say the name. Don't don't just talk about the harm that has come to an individual or even to a community. Speak the name. So that. You, I, I don't know how to say it better that you can't plan to be able to do that. There has to be something within your own heart that knows that defensive responses are, are always going to elicit and in many ways entice some degree of violence. And for you to do that in that context, I, I just think is uh, for both of you. Mm-hmm. So, so mm-hmm. sweet. So, from from the more abstract to, in one sense, a very specific, how have you both seen kindness engage your spouse? And certainly, as the spouses, <laughs> we're glad to encounter your kindness, but how have you both seen your kindness change uh, your spouses? Um, well, I think it's through just knowing, like, if you come home a certain way, I'm, I'm going to meet you with lots of kindness. And do you want this? How was your day? I mean, I can read your face or your mood. And I think that was just very natural. Um, I don't know if you're wanting me to say more, but I mean, I, I don't really like fighting with anyone, but let alone you. So it comes, I love you. It comes because I have a heart of love for you. And I see all that, I see a lot of what you do, and I really respect you. Well, and again, this is where I, I, I would probably push back a little bit to say that there's times you are so freaking playful with me and undermining my irritability, my arrogant presumption, et cetera. Uh, and it, it, you catch me off guard so often with this interchange of, not being defensive, but on the other hand, pulling the rug out from under me. So do you? Do well, you- I mean, I think when you were, we were first married, you would lose your keys twice a day <laughs> for, and it's, you still lose them. And so like, you have to be a little playful, like, you know, the one where you left your keys in the freezer with the ice cream. Cause I could hear you open the freezer from being upstairs. So yeah, I mean, it is sort of, it is fun to be playful and, I think, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I like harmony, so I don't really like to keep angry towards you, so I'll figure out a way. But Becky, I think you said there, what I love, that you, you have learned to read him well, and I, to me, that is such a great kindness to have someone read your life, to read your mm-hmm. face, to 
um, and ponder. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's telltale signs at the end of every <laughs> semester. He's been teaching for a long time. So I know the seasons of, oh, I'm not going to say anything because he's at that end. <laughs> I know when it's okay to be playful and not usually. And sometimes I'm ready for a fight. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> that would happen too. But thanks. Yeah. I, I mean, we found attunement in one another in ways that we've never, we never had in our childhoods or in our young adult years. So that really helps a lot. What about humans? <laughs> <laughs> um, what I've seen, I think um, we were talking a little bit about just the experience of one another's kindness. And I think what I loved hearing from you, Rachel, was a sense of, um, when you are experiencing just my attunement and really kindness in parts of your you and your story um, that have either really been neglected or dismissed um, in in bringing some of those I think things to the surface I think kindness I've seen you Rachel um, feel more free more safe and secure and being able to integrate um, different parts of your life um, that you don't have to leave those things at the door. And uh, to me, I think that's, I think the beauty of kindness that um, we can start to um, cohere different aspects of our lives. Mm-hmm. Well, I just, I'm going to just interject something here <laughs> um, only because I think it's a point worth making. Um, when you tell this story of Africa King, I see something about your fierce kindness, like how fierce you are in, in calling someone to a different opportunity. And I think of some of our interactions and how I haven't been much different in my posture of looking for a fight in a moment where maybe I'm experiencing shame or um, fear. And so I kind of come at you <laughs> maybe a bit like, in my own ferociousness. And I think those are the moments when your kindness really um, undoes me because it's not, it's like you kind of stand in my way with a, um, a seeing and a naming of something um, that I still even subconsciously feel like I'm keeping my vulnerability really far away. And you're inviting me to a different possibility. You're inviting me to bring my maybe more, scared parts into into the space and so i deeply appreciate like how fierce your kindness is and it's changing me and i think that that's an important thing to name about kindness that sometimes Mm -hmm. it's really fierce and it's really courageous well how would we differentiate how would you all differentiate kindness from niceness well i think that's the very part what you were saying rachel that with the kindness when you see someone not being treated right, you can be very fierce because you have empathy for that person who has been shamed or mocked or overseen. And it's like, that's where you stand up against giants, right? You know, you just not going to stand for a bully. And I think that comes from a heart of empathy of seeing the other, of seeing how words or actions have hurt someone who's not accepted or in the in crowd or whatever i'm thinking of playground um situations there but that that goes even in a church setting when someone's overlooked i'm gonna be so fierce to get over there and talk to that person uh who was missed so i think you have eyes because i think that i've i've been missed and a lot and i've been um hurt a lot by just living life and so to see the other is, is the other part of kindness. With that bottom line of n- niceness is a commitment to ease, to comfort, to almost the convenience of having no conflict. Whereas kindness, uh, I think you both have stated uh, very clearly, it, it literally means covering the body of somebody who might be harmed or stepping into 
a relationship with someone who's threatening. There is that ferocity that I think differentiates kindness from m- mere niceness, because niceness is, in many ways, an effort to plaster over conflict, to hide it rather than, in some sense, reading it and knowing you have something to offer. Yeah, I, I would add to that. Just niceness isn't isn't very costly, and I think kindness I think is very costly and takes a lot of work. Again, I think just to name uh, what we have, uh, the ways in which we've been judged and, and hurt, dismissed, abused, and um, wanting something so much different. And there's uh, I think a great deal of fight and ferocity in that costliness. Well, I think, you know, there's a certain, you know, no can very be very kind. And I think nice sometimes feels like you can't say no, um, that that's cruel and mean. And, you know, I just like even thinking about some of these interactions that Michael and I've had, in some ways, his kindness is standing in front of me saying, no, I'm not going to join you in that violence towards yourself. But here's what I will offer you. Um, or uh, I think about like... Um, just that capacity to know that sometimes um, not enabling someone is an incredible kindness. Mm -hmm. Sometimes speaking the way someone has impacted you with particularity and clarity, even if it's really hard to hear, even if it's being shared with anger is, is in some ways a profound act of kindness to, Mm -hmm. to want to have authentic, genuine, like connection and love that, we're fully seen and known to the extent that we can be. Mm. Well, and Rachel, let me turn the question back to you. Where have you seen Michael's kindness change you? (laughs) Well, it's been really fun to ponder this conversation because I think we've gotten to reflect on moments, but you know, I will, I will share uh, a particular moment. Um, I mean, there have been so many um, in our journey of, of getting to know each other and falling in love where again and again and again, I needed to be able to trust myself that I was choosing a good man because of my story. And there were just so many moments where Jesus was like, look at this really kind man who's like, who has a good heart. Um, but I think about, I shared, I think on this podcast about how we had um, our sump pump in our basement back up. And part of that was my fault. Um, I was flushing um, those of you out there who like to use flushable wipes because it just feels kinder to your body, even though some might call them adult wipes, whatever. I don't care. When you have trauma and gut issues, you just want like like tending to your body, not like sandpaper. So, you know, it says flushable. So I was flushing them down the toilet um, and it backed up our sump pump and sewer water backed into our shower. And I just felt so much shame. And my embodied, my bodily expectation was I was going to be punished. And, and so I, you know, just, you know, got, went into fight, flight, or freeze because of the exposure and I'm a fighter. So, I mean, I was coming at Michael, like, you know what, I'll just pay you out of my personal account. It's fine. Or like, you know, I'm sorry, this was all my fault. Like basically putting a lot of words into his mouth <laughs> and always in like a fight, like, let me just kind of like jab you. And then I would like, run up the stairs, you know, like, and I'll also leave. So you can't really engage me. And I just think at some point he was like, I don't need any of these things from you. And I'm really curious, like what is happening for you? Because, um, you're, you're trying to fight me and I feel like you're trying to invite me into violence. And maybe that's not exactly how you said it, but that's how I experienced it. And it led to me having to really ponder, um, how much safer in some ways, contempt would have felt how it would have reinforced um, just the contempt I was already pouring on myself and how scary it was to move towards vulnerability Mm -hmm. um, to not quite know how to ask for what I needed because I didn't, I don't have a lot of imagination yet for what kind of care I need in a moment where I feel really exposed and like I made a mistake and I'm going to cost us money. And, um, and that for me was a moment of just um, his kindness really undoing me and inviting me uh, to a different possibility. Um, and then that led to a lot of grief, you know, because I had to reflect on why is this, why is this the way I, I respond so instinctually? And 
Um, and so, yeah, that's a, it's a moment. <laughs> Kindness can dis- disrupt the familiar. Yeah. And I think that's a really hard, really beautiful process. Well, I, I think that sentence is worth the whole podcast because the very nature of kindness is that power to disrupt. But in the disruption, uh, at least what I've sensed with Becky so often that it can't be even named, uh, it, it's a desire in the disruption to bring something good. Um, around Father's Day, uh, Becky said, as we were taking a walk, you have been a really good father. And my sentence at that point was very dismissive. Uh, and she stopped mid-walk, looked square me in the eye, and said, you listen, you have been a very good father. Mm. I don't want you to dismiss not just me, but what you brought to your children. And that moment of just looking and going, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I wasn't terrified, but there was something in her voice, face, and honor that just felt so difficult to receive, and yet in the receiving, I, I in one sense, it was the best portion of Father's Day. I lo- love the phone calls from the kids, uh, but the blessing that she brought uh, it, and the ability to disrupt the dismissiveness. So I hope people are getting a sense that there is this complexity to kindness, the ability to read, the ability to interact, the ability to disrupt, but also to invite into a goodness that we are all to some degree, um, as much as we may desire, we're also reluctant to receive. Mm -hmm. Well, before we end, uh, I'm just curious as to how kindness has drawn the two of you, but all four of us obviously can respond. How has kindness drawn you into the heart of God? Well, I I think you, when you are kind, it reflects the Father's kindness. Um, I don't deserve kindness all the time, but often, most often, I get it from you. And it's just such a great gift from Jesus that he allowed us to meet and fall in love. And it's like the biggest thing in our lives. Yes. Well, for me to add that, I I just don't believe that God is kind. Uh, I mean, I do. Yes, I do. No, I don't. And the fact of my ambivalence with regard to kindness I, there's no one who continues by the presence of kindness to disrupt my uh, deepest desire. I mean, in, in one sense, I, I, w- I would prefer kindness to any honor in the world. Uh, I would prefer your kindness, you know, after I finish a talk or any other engagement, you know, the only eyes that matter are yours. And because you've told enough truth, I know that the niceness isn't nice. The kindness Mm -hmm. actually tells the truth. But when that truth comes, there is something in my own heart that just says, I can rest in a way that um, a rather frenzied man like me doesn't tend to have a lot of rest. Uh, But that kindness lets something of my soul receive and let down in a way that nothing else, nothing else quite ever brings that level of joy. I love the, well, the Greek word for kindness, Christos, is um, the Greeks used to talk about that in terms of um, vintage wine, old wine that has aged well. Uh, And that's meant to be in contrast to kind of the harshness um, of new wine and the the harshness of the Pharisees. And I think about the experience of kindness in Jesus as one, I think very similar of knowing um, that there's a sense of safety, uh, a gentleness that will lead to, I think, a a new imagination, a new experience, more playfulness. So I, I just think there's just a lot of 
you know, ways to think about kindness in terms of, you know, what safety brings and what gentleness Mm. can bring. When it just feels like that, um, I mean, that just that sense of kindness changes us. It, it, it provokes and evokes hope. It invites our imagination to not only want more, but to want to create more. And so I think for me, um, that language of the kindness of God leads to repentance. It, it is meaning more, more and more and more to me as I experience kindness in the tangible of what it means to be welcome, of what it means for someone to want your goodness. Um, and I think the, yeah, the rest that comes with that kind of grace, but then also the change and the transformation and the desire to um, risk more, um, to be, to live more courageously in kindness with others. Um, I think it is a very, very powerful human capacity that obviously flows from the heart of God. Well, for all of us to be able to say, your kindness, Michael, Becky, it's been a presence and I won't speak for you, Rachel, but certainly for me, it has revealed my own absence of kindness, but also exposed that I long to be a very kind person. And so, that contrast of, I'm not kind, I want to be kind, actually, I'm far kinder than I would have known. And to have the presence of people like Becky, like Michael, in our lives, I don't think there's any simpler way of putting it. It draws us to the kindness of God. And what would it be if we were as individuals, marriages, friendships, uh, but in a broader sense, as a culture, if we were kinder, what would be the transforming power not only in terms of trauma, but the larger category of racial trauma, what the categories of, of a culture literally polarized into levels that some people are arguing is the basis of an eventual civil war. I mean, if there's not kindness that grows within us and in our communities, uh, we will be ongoingly divided in a hostility that only creates even more adversaries and more debris. So, what we're putting words to, uh, I hope people can hear, uh, opens the door to the kind of transformation that only the kindness of God can open us to. But that kindness needs a face for it to become even more real than what we know to be true as the Scriptures speak. We need one another's kindness. So, thank you, both of you, and thank you, Mm -hmm. Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to take a moment as we as we depart to tell you about a few opportunities that I really want to make sure you know about. So if you've been looking for more ways to get involved or are interested in diving into some of your own story work, we wanted to let you know about some exciting new opportunities happening here at the Allender Center. I don't know if you've already heard, but we just launched a brand new online course called To Be Told with the one and only Dan Allender. It's the same content as our conference, but now available for you to watch at home at your own pace. If you've ever found yourself asking, where is God leading me? Or why do I keep repeating the same patterns and ending up in the same types of relationships? I cannot recommend this course enough. You will be invited to love boldly, make sense of your story, find healing, and make changes that last. Speaking of changes, we've had quite a few over the past few months, as many of you know, and one has been that many of our trainings and workshops for the year ahead are now being offered virtually. So, if you've not been able to attend because of travel requirements, this is a truly unique opportunity to take advantage of. The first I want to tell you about is Story Workshop, one that you've definitely heard Dan and I talk about here on the podcast. This workshop invites you to look into the themes of your life in order to understand, write, and tell your unique story in transformative ways. You'll hear teaching from Dan and myself, and actually a lot of other teachers as well. Um, You'll get to participate in small group sessions and receive many helpful resources along the way. 
So I really want to encourage you to check out the story workshop. It's going to be happening in August. Um, the other is our certificate and narrative focused trauma care level one, um, which takes place over the course of four weekends throughout the year and offers training to therapists, pastors, ministry leaders, stay at home moms, engineers, and many other advocates committed to working on behalf of healing and redemption. You get to learn from members of our teaching staff and you participate in a healing process yourself with a group of people under a seasoned facilitator. Both the story workshop and the certificate require applications. So check that out. You can find that on our website at theallendercenter.org, along with information about our new online course. The Allender Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Thank you.